So um, this lesson, um, lesson number four, it's filed as lesson three on your notes, uh, but it's our fourth week, is from Deuteronomy chapter six. So that's where we're going to spend our time today. Um, the two passages of scripture that I, I, I look at as being um, the focal points of teaching on parenting, we dealt with one last week, Ephesians five and six, and then this week, the Old Testament passage, Deuteronomy six. And so... The, the, the lesson today is, is entitled Discipling Your Children, Discipling Your Children. And we've talked a lot about discipleship in our church over the last 10 or so years. Um, and maybe I could start with a question. What it, does it mean to disciple someone? What is discipleship? Yeah, good, good. Come alongside and teach someone what they know. Um, any other aspects to that? That's a pretty good definition, I think. Yes. Help someone follow Christ. Help someone follow Christ. Good. Good. Because what is a disciple? A disciple is a follower. So when we come alongside and teach them what we know about following Christ, we're helping them follow Christ. So we're helping another person um, grow in their faith so that they can learn to follow Jesus like we are. And I, I would add that it's not just simple instruction, but it's shared experience as well. That I liked how Jeff phrased the come alongside. That kind of says the shared experience. So we are coming alongside of them, not as um, someone who knows everything, but as someone who knows something. And we're giving them information, encouraging them, helping them to, to grow in their faith. Um, so how then is that relevant to our parenting? Well, we want our children to come to faith in Christ and then to grow in them. And who better to disciple our children than us? Who better to disciple our kids than mom and dad? This isn't the church's responsibility, although we're here to help and we will do anything we can to help you disciple your children. And it's not a school's responsibility, it's our responsibility as parents. Last week we ended with Ephesians 6, 4, which said, bring up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And you could summarize this by saying, this is a command to disciple your children. Bring them up in the dis discipline. There's a correction element to that. And instruction, there's a teaching element. And it's of the Lord. It's in the Lord we want to be bringing them up. What we'll see from Deuteronomy 6 is some real parallel thoughts to, to what we talked about last week. And this is kind of the key verse. You shall teach them diligently to your children. We'll unpack this a little bit more as we go along. But first, a little bit of context for, um, for this passage. So Deuteronomy is near the end of the wilderness wandering. It is preparation for coming into the promised land. So if you think about who is being addressed here, it's not the first generation of Israelites who came out of Egypt in the Exodus. Those people, by and large, maybe there's a few ones, but by and large, bless you. <laughs> by and large, those, that first generation is gone. They have died in the wilderness over the last 40 years. They are the ones that came up to Kadesh Barnea and said, oh, no, we can't do this. We are too small. And they could not see a God who was too big. And so they backed away and God said, okay, you can, you can wander for 40 years in the wilderness until all of you die. Everybody 20 and older, with a few exceptions. So chapter one talks about remembering Kadesh Barnea. And so Moses is speaking to the second generation primarily. The second generation, let's call them the wilderness generation, the ones who grew up in the wilderness. They grew up having to wander around, even though they were under 20 years old, or maybe they were born in the wilderness. They had to wander because of the effect of their parents' son. In chapter two and three, um, there's another call for remembrance, and it's a remembrance of earlier victories. These are victories on the east side of the Jordan River before they crossed the Jordan and came into the promised land. And, and so Moses is saying, listen, you know, God fought those battles. He'll fight future battles. He reminded them of that. There's some leadership succession um, in chapter three, how the, the torch is being passed to Joshua. So just as we're going from generation one to generation two, kind of globally in Israel, we're also doing it from a leadership perspective. And then 
chapter four, Moses starts teaching about obedience and he is encouraging them to obey, he calls out a few specific things they need to pay attention to. Chapter five, he explains it more and he re-gives the 10 commandments in chapter five. And so on the, on the heels of this reteaching of the 10 commandments, now we get to chapter six and here's what he has to say. So he's, he's teaching this to the generation who grew up wandering in the wilderness and they're about to go into the promised land and they are going to face challenges that their parents didn't face. Their parents face hardships that they're not going to face. And what do they need to know? So here's where we get into Deuteronomy chapter six. Can I have somebody read for us verses one through six? A little bit of a longer segment than we'll do in other places, but Jeff, yeah, thanks. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded you to keep, that you may do them in the land which you are going over. Possess it that you may fear the Lord your God with you and your son, son, son by keeping all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly for the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord of our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. All right, thank you. All right, so in, in verses one through six, Moses is laying out a need for the wilderness generation to hear these commandments. And actually in verse one, he says the, the commandment, right? He said, now this is the commandment, the statute and the rules that the Lord commanded me to teach you. So there's a real focus Moses is saying, listen, I have a responsibility to teach you. And your responsibility is going to be to teach the next generation. So he's going to be passing the baton too. But why do they need to hear these commandments? Now, if you focus on the word that in these verses, you're going to see what these reasons are. I didn't put them on. They're on your notes, I think. So five reasons that we see as to what the, what the five reasons for the need to teach these commandments. So in first one is so that they would be able to obey completely. See at the end of verse six, it says that you may be able to do them in the land. So just do it, right? A little nod to Nike again, just do it. Just obey. You have to know what it is God wants before you can obey what it says. So first of the first reason for the need for teaching is obedience. Second one in the beginning of um, verse two, and he's going to pick up this theme later in the chapter, so that they would be able to fear God generationally. They'd be able to fear God. He says, you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's sons. So three generations. So you, wilderness generation, your son, and you call them the conquering generation, or you know, actually, so the wilderness generation becomes the conquering generation. So it's, it's their children. And then one more generation after that, your grandchildren, so that they would all fear God. Now, how do you fear God? By keeping his commandments, back to obedience. So we demonstrate the fear of God by, show, by obeying the things that he has commanded us to do. The third reason, so that they would be able to live long. So here's a promise that, uh, that, it was, that was built into the Mosaic covenant, the way that God dealt with people at that time is like, if you obey, you will be blessed. So there was a direct connection under the Mosaic Covenant for long life. Verse four, so that their life would go well for them, so that they would have a good life. Again, this is obedience equals blessing in this Old Testament construct. And then so that they would multiply greatly, so that they would fulfill that part of the Abrahamic Covenant that the, the Abraham, Abraham's descendants would be like the sand of the sea, sand on the seashore. It would multiply greatly. And then verses four and five, what commandment did they most need to hear? What was the most vital piece of information that they needed? 
Was it all Ten Commandments? No, it wasn't. That's kind of remarkable to me. He just gave the Ten Commandments. He talked about some other kind of important commands in chapter 5. But he comes to this and he boils it all down. And he says, you have one God. He has to be exclusive. And you need to more than obey him. You need to love him completely. So we see, first of all, he gives like this theological underpin for this command. Hear, O Israel. I lost my place. Sorry. Hear, O Israel. The Lord your God, the Lord is one. So commentators tell us that this is more than just the unity of God. This is the exclusivity of God. There are no other gods. Everything else has a small G in front of it. There's nothing else that deserves our worship, our love, and our obedience. So you shall love the Lord your God, God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. This is a way of saying, as we would say today, with everything you've got, with everything you have, with every fiber of your being, you need to love God more than anything. I think this is really a key to generational spiritual succession, that we have got to more than just teach our children to obey. Why? Because I'm the father. <laughs> because I told you to. Obey. Why? Because it pleases Jesus. It's Colossians 3. Well, why do I want to please Jesus? Well, let me tell you why. What an opportunity there, right? So we need to be teaching our children that why we obey is because we love God and we fear him because we respect him for who he is. And then why is this the most, or what is the key to obeying this commandment? Why is this commandment? so vital it needs to be on our heart in verse six these words that i command you today shall be on your heart a couple lessons ago we talked a lot about the heart we talked about how the heart was the key to helping our children learn how to obey that we want their heart to be oriented toward god and not toward themselves which is their natural bent we need their hearts to love god more than anything this is what we need to be teaching them. We need to store those commandments in our heart. They need to understand the importance of hearing God's word and the importance of learning God's word, respecting that, understanding God's uniqueness, and that the ability to live for God starts in our hearts. So our discipling of our children needs to start with what we love. And then it needs to go to what our kids love. He's saying, Moses is saying to the, the second generation, it needs to be in your heart. And then you need to teach it to their hearts. So once again, we see this primary emphasis on our personal responsibility for our walk with the Lord. There's no one else that can walk with the Lord for you. You have to do it yourself. There's lots of things that can help. There's lots of people that can come alongside and help. God built the community of faith to be a collaborative experience. A cooperative experience. He did not build us to be lone rangers, and yet ultimately every one of us is responsible before God for our own walk with him. And so we need to walk with God first so that we can then teach our children how to walk with God. So step one in discipling our kids is the question, do I love God more than anything else? Hmm. We need to answer that question for ourselves. Do I personally love God more than anything else? Move on to the second point. It includes a key verse. Teach your children diligently. Someone read for us 7 through 9, please. Anna, thanks. Now, it would be easy for some of us to say, well, I'm no teacher. You know, I, I, I don't know how to teach. I can barely put a sentence together. You see any exceptions here in this passage? Hmm. 
Let me ask you this. Do you love God? Yeah. Then you're a teacher. So how do we teach? A little bit different story. But if you love God, then you can teach your children how to love God. How do you love God? How does it work? These verses tell us the how. And it, it basically says, it's just God's word's got to be coming out of us all the time, everywhere we are. And we have to be teaching our children through the way that we live on a daily basis. They see us up close and personal, you know, more than anybody except our spouse. Right? We can put on a good front at church, we can put on a good front at work, in the grocery store, whatever. But at home, it's all there. They know us. We have a responsibility to be living out God's word, to be teaching them generationally. This teach them diligently. Teach diligently is one word in Hebrew, evidently. And it means, there's a meaning of it, to sharpen. We need to be sharpening them. We need to be paying attention as you sharpen. Anybody ever like hand sharpened a knife or an ax. Yeah, so just 20 seconds to describe how that happens. Take a metal file and across the blade, remove the metal. Okay. Yeah, so the correct way is like, like show us, like, what does that mean? Oh, that, that means basically you have to file it all the same direction if you go back and forth. Yeah, so if you, that's not going to end up in a dull blade, right? Right. So you have to be paying attention. So you have to know what you're doing. You have to file in the right direction. This is what we need to do with our children. We need to be pointing them in the right direction consistently in order to sharpen them. It takes intentionality. It takes diligence. It takes determination. <laughs> As the years get long, it's easy to get tired. But we've got to be doing that on a continual basis. We have a responsibility to convey biblical truth to our kids orally, to be teaching them, this is what God says. And then we have a responsibility to be living out what God says to us. So one of the primary ways that we're given here for teaching is making it part of our everyday lives. Look at how practical this is. In verse 7, you'll talk to them when you sit in your house. Boy, this sounds like family dinner, right? Everybody's around the, the dinner table. We're talking about God. We're sitting down instead of turning on the television. We're talking about God. We're getting ready for church on Sunday morning. We're talking about God. We sit down and you walk by the way. So what is the way? This is a path. So when we're walking down the path, Maybe we could say when we are driving down the road, this should be part of normal conversation. This shouldn't be like a huge exception. When you lie down, when you rise up, that's another way of saying all the time, like every day, all the time. This is something that's just part of our lives. And then binding them on our hands and on our foreheads. And you know, some of the Jewish people took this very literally and, and did this. And, and I think there's, you know, I'm not criticizing that necessarily, what the point is that this the word needs to be so pervasive in our lives that it is affecting all of our actions, what our hands do, and it's affecting everything that we're letting in our eyes. It's always in front of us. It is the governing body of our lives. We'll write them on our doorposts. To me, this is like a sign to the community. People that walk by our doorposts see we love God here. So our lives need to be making it known to the community of whoever it is around us that God is an important part of that for us. It's pervasive. So we see here that in discipling our kids, we need to maintain a close relationship with God over the long haul, not episodically, not sporadically, not just on Sundays, not just on good days, but on all days. Verses 10 to 15, uh, for time's sake, I'm just going to summarize that for you. This is fearing God continually. There, you could break this, this section down in a few different ways. This is just one way that I did it. It focuses, first of all, on not forgetting God. Well, why would this generation forget God? Because the next generation is going to come in. The wilderness generation is going to become the conquering generation. They're going to conquer the land. And then the, their children and their children's children 
are going to be handed things that they never had to work for. They are be go they're going to be given a good life. They're going to have olive trees that they didn't plant. They're going to have crops in fields that they never had to level or remove the stones from. They're going to have walls that were built for them, cities that are ready to live in. This is a pretty easy life compared to wandering around in the desert for 40 years. And one of the primary temptations of the good life is to forget where the good life came from. Not having experienced hardship, but to experience good life, there's a different temptation that they are going to face that the wilderness generation didn't face because of the hardship they went through. They need to understand who God is. And they need to keep fearing God and not forgetting him. They need to keep serving God and, no, and only serving God because they're going to be tempted to serve other gods. Because they're going to forget how God is or who God is and how great he is. Move on to point four. We need to keep God's commandments diligently. So back to obedience. So this is kind of like, um, like, a, like a, a second act of those first few verses of the chapter where he talks about obeying God. He says, listen, you know, you, you and your, your fathers put God to the test at, at Massa. You know, when you complained about the water, you did all these things in the wilderness. Don't do that when you're in the, in the promised land. Just obey God. More obedience is encouraged. And just like we were to teach diligently, we are to obey diligently. And then this last section, section five, maybe one of my favorite sections of this chapter, actually, and that's to answer ch children's questions biblically. So let's read this section. Someone read for us verses, actually starts in 20, I have that there, sorry. Verse 20. Through 25 into the chapter. So we got for us. Yeah, when your son asks you in the future, what is the meaning of the decrees, statutes, and ordinances which the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him you were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand. For our eyes, the Lord was with great and devastating signs and wonders. And he brought us from there in order to do this to make us the land of the Lord our God. The Lord commanded us to follow all these statutes and to fear the Lord our God for our prosperity always and for our preservation as we have. My covenant will be ours if we are careful to follow every one of these commands before the Lord our God. All right, thank you. So the first point here is really to expect your kids to ask questions and expect them to ask questions about a lot of things but expect them to ask questions about spiritual matters the, the, this verse 20 starts with the word when so it's not if it's when when is like this is going to happen we just don't know exactly the point in time when it where it will occur and so he's saying prepare prepare for your children to ask questions and what is the specific question that these children were expected to ask? Why are the stones there? Yeah, so the stones from crossing the, the Jordan, and then there, later in the book of Joshua, there was another stone that was erected, the Stone of Victory. So symbols of things that God had done in the past, things that God had commanded them to do, and then God showed up and did it for them. At the end of verse 20, the, the question that this son asks is, what is the meaning of the testimonies and statutes and rules? Why all the rules, Dad? Why do we have to do all this stuff? And there was a lot of them in the Old Testament. All of this very precise procedure. And the son is like, Dad, I don't get it. Why do we have to do this? Why do we have to take a land all the way to Jerusalem every year? This is crazy. But this question says, you know, what are the rules that the Lord, our God, has commanded? This is a son that is embracing the relationship with the Father. And this question is welcomed. I think this is a really important point. We need to create family cultures and church cultures in which questions are welcomed. 
Honest questions deserve honest answers. We need good questions to come from our kids because those are great teaching opportunities. So anybody have a kid who asks excessive questions? Oh, wow, we have quite a few, okay. All right, that is a different challenge, right? That is hard. And shaping those little wills and those little hearts is gonna be different than the child who asks no questions. Anybody have those? Kids that ask no questions. Yeah, it, it, you got them on both ends of the spectrum. And then there's some that, some kids are more thoughtful than others. Some are more observant than others. All of them are gonna be in a different place spiritually. We tend to think of our kids as having the same experiences in our homes. And so you know, kind of expect their spiritual growth to happen in a, or spiritual sensitivity to happen in the same way. No, they all have little hearts that are rebels. So they're all gonna go their own way. How, so just, this is not a rhetorical question. How do we create a culture in our family that encourages questions, that encourages children to think and ask? Openly listening? Excellent, yeah, good. Good, so a little protection around it. So they, they're, th that kind of, there may be a little fear of asking this question. So we're taking the fear away. Like, listen, judgment-free, just ask the question. Good. Just in the name of the say ask thought-provoking questions. I think we can model this. We can ask thought-provoking questions, which then might get the engine running, that gets the questions flowing. and. That I think is a really, really good thing to do. Yeah. I think that affirmation is, is really a big part of this. It's like, that's a really good question. I'm glad you're thinking like that. I think that kind of thing is, is really helpful more than just saying, here's the answer. <laughs> what do you do if you have a question you don't know the answer to? There you go. Excellent. So that, that takes some humility to do that, right? I think as a, as a father, I felt the like, burden to like know the answer. It's just impossible to know all the answers, right? They're going to ask a question that if you just give a flip off the cuff answer, you've missed an opportunity. And so I think better to say, that's a really good question and that deserves a really good answer. I'm not sure that I have the best answer right now, so let me think about that and then get back to them. And I think encouraging that shows humility. But it also, it also shows them that you're being thoughtful and you're taking the question seriously. I think those are really good responses. So let's look then at the model answer that we have in this passage. Let's give our kids biblically rich answers to spiritual questions, questions about spiritual things. So here's the elements of the model answer. First of all, there's like a synopsis in verse 21. Let's just reread that. Then you shall say to your son, okay, here's a way you answer. What, what, why, why all the rules? Yeah. Here's the answer to that question. We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Ooh. How does that relate to why all the rules? What is he saying? Hmm. So setting some perspective here that like the perspective we need to have is a, is a perspective of gratitude. We were brought out of Egypt because we were once what? Slaves. And now we are free. Does have any parallels for us in the New Testament? Wait, 
Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. He's saying we had a desperate condition where we could not save ourselves. And God did a dramatic rescue. We've got to communicate that in a way to our kids that they see how much it means to us. We were slaves and God saved us. He brought us out. We were slaves to sin. Just like you're a slave to sin right now. Jesus Christ died for me. I trusted in him, just like you need to do. You know, there, there is a direct parallel here to how we communicate with our kids about overpowering sin, for example. Whether, you know, before they're a believer, after they're a believer. Then we really get a more for your money kind of answer in verses 22 through 25, more explanation. And what is the focus here in 22 through 25? What is the focus? All that God has done. Yeah. So it doesn't actually talk about the rules. It talks about our great God how big he is, how mighty he is. It says in verse 22, the Lord showed signs and wonders. He's saying, we have a great God. He is so powerful. We're, you know what he's doing? He's teaching theology. He's teaching his children who God is. Verse 23, he brought us out from there. Not only do we have a great God, but he did something great for us. And he gave us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. What is he saying there? God is a promise-keeping God. He gave us the land that he promised to give us. He's reliable. He's faithful. And then the Lord commanded us to observe these statutes, these rules. So he brings it back to the question. He doesn't answer the question first. In this case, he could. But he walks him through all of this to get to this. So he says God is mighty, God is faithful, and God is fearful. Three important qualities of our relationship with God. These commandments teach us how to relate to him because he is good and he's faithful and he's powerful and fearful. These commandments create righteous living. These commandments show that he is our authority, one that we need to respect. So in summary, I would say we need to be teaching the character of God through our personal experience. As your kids grow up, they need to hear your personal testimony of salvation. They need, if, you're, if your parents are believers, they need to hear that too from their mouths. You can do that. And I would say capture that in writing. Capture it on video. Capture it somewhere so that you have a legacy of generational faith if that's part of your family. If it's not, God saved you, start with that. Want to do that. So here's our point, really, for today. We need to disciple our children by teaching and living God's word on a daily basis. We're all teachers. It's a question of what we teach and how we teach it. We can all improve. We can all get better. There's things that we can do just from a practical standpoint to do that, but we all need to realize that we have a responsibility to disciple our children. All right. So homework. Just ask that you continue working on that family mission statement if that's if you think that has value for you. If you don't, then I get it. That's fine. Um, and then a resource spotlight. I wanted to highlight this book. Um, this one was new to me. So I just read this over the last two months. Disciple Making Parent by Chap Bettis. He was a pastor down in Rhode Island for 25 years and now has a ministry. I don't know if he's still a pastor. I don't think so. Uh, maybe he is. He planted the church in Rhode Island, and he has a, a focus on, on parenting now in his ministry. He has a podcast, if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, he has, like, frequent emails that you can go to his website and get as well. But I, I found that book to be, you know, very focused on the process of making disciples with the children, and I, um, I think it was pretty helpful. He cites the Ted Tripp book a number of times that we talked about the very first time, so... Uh, kind of like, okay, other people are recognizing the value of that work as well. Yeah, I thought that was good. Uh, 